Welcome to Plug and Play. Uh, really happy to have you here. Really uh, grateful that you'll spend the time with us, uh, part, part of our programs. I want to quickly introduce uh, myself. I'm Mark Steiner. I'm our general counsel. Uh, we do over 200 investments a year uh, in startups, and uh, it makes for a really exciting landscape every year. You see different kinds of technologies, new startups, great corporate partners that work with us. And this talk is specifically going to be focused about key financing terms. So whether you're a startup or you're a corporate, uh, or you know, meaning a representative of a corporation, and you're looking into investing in startups, we're going to talk about what you should be thinking about, whether you're a founder, whether you're an investor, what are the key terms in, in venture capital financing. So um, as I mentioned, we do over 200 investments a year at Plug and Play. Generally speaking, these are uh, smaller investments, so we do have a couple funds as well and uh, the smaller investments come from our family office. Of the 200 plus investments, we're increasingly international, so we do uh, about 40% of our investments internationally. I'll talk at the end of this discussion a little bit about some of the very high level differences between some of the different jurisdictions, but that's a whole talk in and of itself. Uh, lastly, I would just mention that as general counsel, I've been working with uh, uh, Plug and Play for a long time. I've been in venture capital for over 12 years, and the landscape has definitely shifted where you see more capital from more sources, uh, and terms have evolved over time. But the good news is, is that venture capital terms are, generally speaking, uh, pretty consistent, and so we'll talk about some of those themes here as we go through this, uh, these slides. So we wanted to start here first with just kind of an outline, pause here for a minute so you can kind of see where we're going. Uh, for those of you who are very experienced in this uh, subject matter, uh, you're going to find a little bit of this high level. This discussion is more for high level uh, introductory uh, comments to help people uh, set the foundation for knowledge in this space. So starting with uh, startup development stages and financing structures. I want to be clear here that there's an incredible discussion that could be had about these first two uh, check boxes that you see here. So we could talk all day, and it wouldn't necessarily be me, it would be one of our brilliant people in ventures, our ventures department, Yvonne, George, uh, we could go on and on with all of our wonderful uh, team members there. They could talk about what kind of metrics we look for or what are the kind of metrics that Series A, B, C, V, Cs look for in the software space, in the hardware space, in terms of how do you set a pre-money valuation. People kind of always ask, hey, you know, how do you determine a startup's worth $10 million as a pre-money valuation or 20 or 50 or 100 or 2 or 5? Um, those valuation methods would be a great discussion, but that's not what the purposes of this discussion is for. So regardless of business-wise, how you come up with that valuation, uh, let's assume uh, for now that the, the parties have agreed on that kind of business valuations because then we're going to talk about everything that kind of comes next. So for me, uh, the only place where valuation somewhat matters and the amount of capital somewhat matters is basically two buckets for me early stage versus growth stage. And you'll hear so many different things. What's a seed investor, an angel investor, pre-A, A. These words don't have any legal significance, and in certain ways, they, to me, they don't have a lot of business significance. Really, it comes down to, you'll see from the arrows there, if you're an, you know, an early stage investor or you're a startup still at an early stage, you're looking at receiving your capital from either a convertible note or a safe, generally speaking, in, these, in, in Silicon Valley or throughout the states. and those convertible notes and, convert and, and safes are convertible securities, and we'll distinguish them in the next couple slides between preferred stock. So when you see growth stage, that's what we're referring to as preferred stock. And so to me, there's a real clear demarcation between those two groups. We'll discuss that. Because there are two themes that I always want anybody, investor, founder, anybody, to just pay attention to and understand fully when they're negotiating a term sheet or an investment in a startup because there are two things that really, really matter. One is dilution, and the second is control. Okay, I'm gonna go back to dilution to start, set the stage there, but I want you to be able to see control here for a second too. We'll come back to this topic. So dilution. Uh, what I wanna explain here is I use kind of a hypothetical. Imagine that you are a founder, and, and you may already be a founder, uh, or, or you may be looking at investing in some founders, but imagine you, you go and you take your own company and, and, you're, and you just started building it, you built your first deck, you're really excited about the company, and uh, suddenly you're just kind of at a uh, coffee shop or something like that, you're punching away at your deck, just 
hypothetical here, and somebody walks in and, and, and they say, hey, how is it going? And they talk to you for you know five minutes about, about what you're working on, and they say, you know, I happen to just be very, very rich, and I love your idea, and I want to invest a million dollars in your company right now. I, I'm just, give me the paperwork, I'll sign. Now, right then and there, should you be excited? I mean, I, I would be instantly excited. I think most people would instantly be excited to be offered a million dollar check. That sounds pretty exciting. Then let's say that the, this, this person who's walked in and, and is really fascinated by your startup wants to invest a million, kind of imagine them with a long pause. Like, I really want to invest one million dollars in your company. I'm so excited. And I want to invest that one million dollars at a one million dollar pre-money valuation. Okay, so then at that point, suddenly you should be thinking to yourself, wait, so one million dollar pre-money valuation, and if they're investing one million dollars, try to keep simple math here, that means that they're going to have a two million dollar post money valuation for you, your company, and that means they're gonna hold 50% of the equity in your company, okay? That is huge because right off the bat, it more or less makes them a co-founder, almost from day one. It gives them 50% voting interest in the company, and that's gonna instantly change everything about your, your company in so many different ways, which we're gonna talk about control and how control normally works in a startup. Normally startups don't give away 50% in their first investment. So I just use that story to really emphasize how dilution matters. You know, the pre-money valuation matters a lot, but so does the amount that you raise too. Those are both two variables that work together. So for example, a million dollars sounds great, but not if it's at a million dollar pre-money valuation. Now, let's say that of course, you as the founder say, whoa, whoa, whoa one million, I, 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 I really appreciate the investment offer here, one million dollars sounds amazing, but I can't take it at one million dollar valuation. Well, you might, for example, have two variable options here as an example. You could say, I can take on a million dollar investment, but only if the pre-money valuation is four million. I can give you 20% of my company, five million dollar post, okay? Or, alternatively, let's say that immediately, for example, the investor says, I don't think you're worth four million. I love you, but this is brand new. You just show me a deck in a coffee shop. I don't think you're worth four. Well, the alternative is you could say, okay, well, in that case, then just invest $100,000 in my company right now. Because $100,000 at a million dollar pre-money valuation is more like, you know, between nine and 10% there, if you want to do the exact math. So. Uh, you can kind of see how there's two variables here, and that's what I'm saying. Of course, for a founder, you would always want a higher pre-money valuation. For a, an investor, you'd always want the lowest valuation you could get. Those are just, you know, diametrically opposed sort of interests. We're just purely speaking math and and uh, making money. But there's also this more kind of key and, and therefore uh, variable that I think you can move around more, and there's more thought to it. Is how much to raise at what valuation. And that is really a key, I, I think more so for founders than investors, but I think it applies to both. So uh, that, that's where you see that first checkpoint there. How much does a startup need to raise to hit a milestone? That's really important. Uh, and that's important at the early stage and the growth stage because you're trying to think at each stage, what's the key milestone here? So I'll, I'll go really quick through some examples. If you are you know, early stage and you're, you know, pre-series A round, okay, and you're thinking, well, you should be thinking uh, in a certain way, besides from building in a course, an incredible business, customers love your product, uh, we could talk about those kinds of talks forever, but strictly speaking, kind of more from a, from a uh, financing perspective, you'd be thinking, okay, well, what am I? Am I B2B SaaS? Uh, you know, what kind of area am I in? And if I'm trying to attract a, a series A venture capital firm to write a five or $10 million check, what metrics do I need to hit? Uh, for example, like you know, let's just take something simple. Like Facebook has, you know, used to have users, and, and well, even to today, you can sign up for free. So certain companies are based on their users. Other companies are based on their number of pilots or the number of customer contracts, their revenue. So whatever the figures may be, whatever kind of company you are, you have to think about what are those milestones. And that you'd have to kind of do some research and and, and talk to a lot of different people because that can shift. That totally depends on the industry. Can even depend on by the venture capital firm. So you do want to think about, generally speaking, once you have a picture of the milestones you want to meet, how much money do I need to raise now to meet those milestones, you know, and how fast do I want to get there? So for example, if you think, I need to get this many users or this much revenue or develop this elements of my product in X period of time, six months, 12 months, 18 months, whatever it is, how much money do I need to, you know, have my operating expenses covered for that period of time? 
plus always a buffer. Uh, things never, generally speaking, go quite as well as you'd hoped, and yet are still kind of going amazingly. I think that's kind of the story of a startup, that you're building an amazing company, and yet you, know, you have all these dreams and visions, and each set of the way you tend to have you know, uh, different challenges. So if you figure out what that amount of money is, and how long it'll take you. That'll kind of tell you a little bit about how much A you want to raise, and then also as an investor, I think it lets you know how much capital is needed. So for example, let's say that a startup determines that to build, fully build out its software product and sign its first five uh, corporate customers, that that would take uh, 18 months. And you would need, if you need you know, three engineers and one salesperson or whatever it may be, that it would cost you your burn rate, you're estimating you need $2 million to make it through 18 months, and you'll meet those milestones. Well, if that's the case, do you need to raise all two million day one, just after you finished your deck? And we talked about that one million pre. So you can stagger the amount of money that you raise at different valuation caps, for example, if it's convertible securities. That's one example. Let me go a little bit more downstream, and I think there's a really key decision around the Series B time for a lot of startups. This is this is more my opinion here. So. At the Series B stage, let's say that a startup is contemplating raising $50 million at a $250 million pre-money valuation. Well, at that point, once you raise that kind of money, that's setting you on a course for a large exit, or else you'll be disappointed in how the waterfall works. I'm going to come around to that topic. I just want to switch to control, but just kind of a little bit of a teaser there that uh, when, you're, when you get to that point, then you're thinking in a different way. Your milestone might be, what's our exit strategy? Who's going to acquire us? What does it take to go IPO? Uh, you have to think about your exit strategy and how much you need to raise to achieve that, and also what happens if you raise this money and you don't necessarily achieve all of your goals, but achieve maybe some of them. So the, the last bullet point there, just to answer the question, uh, this is super uh, high level. I don't want you to take away that these are rules or anything that needs to be followed whatsoever. but. If I had to at least give you guys a little bit of guidance here, pre-Series A, startups tend to give away somewhere between 10 and 10 and 25% of their cap table. Uh, series A, again, about if you include employee pool, increases uh, you know, 20 to, to 25%. And then Series B is more like 10, but again, very much uh, those are very high level rules of thumb. So th those numbers can deviate quite a bit from what I mentioned. Okay, let's talk about control. So. We talked about valuation, we talked about how much you raised, and dilution, whether it's convertible securities, convertible notes, safes, or preferred stock, all of it is dilutive. Okay, all of it is dilutive. Generally speaking, the vast majority now of safes and convertible notes for any early stage investor that knows what they're doing are going to have a valuation cap, meaning that at the sort of as a floor, the bare minimum, they're going to get an amount of equity representing that valuation. So in terms of as a startup or an investor, you know, and, and thinking about how much of a company you're buying, that's, that's always in play, regardless of the form or shape of the investment. But control massively changes depending on whether you're investing in a convertible security or raising a convertible security, or if you're selling preferred stock. So let's talk about control. So if I'm writing a million dollar check or a five million dollar check and, and the hypo would take 50% interest or if I'm a normal VC and I write a five million dollar check at a 20 million dollar pre-money valuation. That's a lot of money. You want to shepherd and control the investment to a degree. Okay, so a normal venture capital firm is going to say uh, after they negotiate with you and, and decide what your pre-money valuation is and how much you're going to raise and employee pool and we're going to go over some cap table things a little bit but once they figure that out then they're going to discuss more or less what kind of control are we going to have over the company? Now, thankfully, a lot of venture capital terms at the Series A stage, B, C, are standardized at National Venture Capital Association, NVCA. They have a great website, a great, a great organization. You can check their templates and it'll give you a feel for what's pretty market uh, throughout the, you know, the experienced venture capital firms and, and uh, experienced startups. So within uh, the NBCA terms or within kind of standard practices, uh, each venture capital firm will, generally speaking, take the lead investor will take a board seat, and they will also implement what are called protective provisions. And so I want to go over both of those. So when you're a startup and you raise Series A, you're really changing the whole uh, path of your company from that point on, but it's a very regular, I'd say the considerable, considerable majority of startups raise at least a Series A. Um, before you know a, a larger exit, so 
uh, taking on that venture capital firm is kind of really part of most startups' journey. So what happens is at that point is they'll take one board seat, which functionally doesn't have that much uh, heavy-duty control uh, impact because usually your board at that point will have three board seats. You'll usually have the founders or founder control two seats, and you'll have the venture capital firm take one seat. So out of three, you know, one will be controlled by an investor. And majority decisions on the board you know, are typically what are required for things. So if we're talking more of the day-to-day -day operations, are you, of course, going to work closely with your lead VC? Are you going to lean on their resources? Are you going to uh, want their guidance and advice? You are. Are you going to have board meetings together with the venture capital firm? You are. But in terms of can the VC block you if there's any kind of Conflict's a strong word when you talk about startups and venture capital firms, but you know, just a disagreement about strategy or a different perspective on on, a, on approach. Uh, if a venture capital firm feels differently than than you as a founder, as a founder, you can still move forward with your decisions. If we're just talking about the board, now, major decisions of the company, for example, whether to raise another round of financing or whether to get acquired, those are provisions that need to be approved by the venture capital firm. So those are specific terms that the Series A, and that's why I'm referring to the firm, because the venture capital firm controls the majority of, of a Series A amount of Series A stock. So that VC will determine whether you do push on to the next financing. The VC will determine whether you uh, uh, take an exit uh, offer, whether it be an acquisition or an asset purchase agreement, aqua hire, or whatever it may be, sort of good or bad, you're gonna have to run that and get separate approval from the venture capital firm. So the, the, the converse here is convertible securities do not take that control. So when you're raising from quote unquote angels or you're joining accelerators or you're uh, working with micro VCs or the scout funds of major VCs, a lot of different investors use convertible securities and they use them, those investors use them specifically because they are, don't want to spend the typically like thirty to forty thousand dollars of legal fees for a Series A financing, which aren't just for drafting the docs. That's for due diligence and other things. But the time and effort it takes to negotiate those terms and the amount of control. Let's just take plug and play for example. We can't sit on two hundred boards a year and compounding that year over year. And we also uh, just can't take that level of control of approval rights over everything. That would just be unwieldy for us and unwieldy for our portfolio companies. So we want things to move efficiently so we don't take that level of control. But if we were doing one-tenth of the number of deals that we do per year and increasing our check size massively, we would have a very different approach. So the key point to convertible securities is that they're fast. They're fast and they give you money as a founder and they're fast for an investor and easy for an investor. Key thing though is that convertible securities do not give control. Okay, so uh, let's talk quickly about preferred stock. I want to go over some of these key provisions. We could have a whole long discussion about this more in depth about some of the kind of nuts and bolts of this, but again, we're going to try to keep this more high level. So uh, preferred stock, one of the key things is a, what's called a liquidation and dividend preferences. Okay, there are two different preferences here. Liquidation preference is what basically if the company goes out of business that the uh, Series A investor will receive their money first before the founders who hold common stock. For anybody, employees, founders, anybody who has common stock, the Series A uh, investors will receive their money first if the company goes out of business. Okay. Same thing with uh, Series B, C, except that they stack. So Series C would receive their money if there's anything left and return all their money before Series B, who would then draw it, then Series A. Okay, now as the company goes out of business, so imagine a scenario where there's very little, uh, where disappointingly, uh, you know, for example, Series A invested five million, and the startup's assets are sold ultimately for one million. Uh, so the VC is going to lose four million, but they are going to recapture the full one million of the asset sale. Nothing's going to go to the founders or the employees based purely off of that. Okay. One thing I'll side note here is the retention bonuses, what I call off the cap table stuff. We'll talk about that uh, in our acquisition uh, uh, summary a, a little bit later. Uh, but uh, startup founders can be compensated by the acquiring company sort of outside of these liquidation preference uh, structures. So what matters here is a scenario where a startup gets acquired for a, a, a decent amount of money. That's where things I'd say get really complicated and you want to try to think through that. So. Uh, before I dive into that, I kind of explained if you go out of business, it's a pretty simple liquidation you know, waterfall. 
If you get acquired for billions upon billions of dollars, wonderful. That's also a very simple process where the liquidation preference here is irrelevant, more or less, because every single shareholder is simply going to say, okay, based on my share number, I own 5% of the company, or 10, or 20, or a founder owns 30, or whatever. Everybody's gonna say, I get my pro rata, my ratable percentage of the total 4 billion, or 10 billion, or whatever it may be. That amount of money should be so great that every investor is receiving an multi, you know, exceptional multiple return on their investment. The founders are receiving a lot of money, employees are receiving a lot of money, that happy day for everybody. So in those situations, it's not that there's a, there's a waterfall of money descending to different classes, it's just everybody shares evenly out of, the, you know, out of the proceeds based on their percentage holding of the company. Okay, where there's a lot of gr interesting gray area, which we could talk about for a long time, and I'll try to keep it uh, briefer is that that Series B demarcation that I mentioned. So imagine that you're a startup, you raise five million in your Series A. You raised before your Series A with different angels, accelerators, other, you raised uh, two million. So two plus five, you've raised seven million dollars. Then Series B, you make the decision, we're gonna raise 50 million dollars, we're going to scale this company, and we're going big. Great. So you've raised 57 million dollars to date, you spend the next two or three years building out your company much more at scale. Ultimately, you know, how timing can work, how a lot of other different factors can work. Let's say that uh, you're starting to feel like we're getting low on cash again, we're not sure about the next financing round, what kind of valuation that would be at, or just ultimately more the long-term uh, perspective of the company and, 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 and an offer comes to you as the founder. So usually it'll kind of come more so to the founders directly. Then you might be meeting with uh, one of our major corporate partners, for example, and they might say, we're, we're very interested in acquiring you and we're just spitballing here. And, and then we could even get to a term sheet stage, but you'd want to talk to your investors before and I'll explain. But let's just say at a dinner and they're like, we'd like to acquire your company for $75 million. Okay, $75 million. The number of startups that get acquired for $75 million out of versus all the numbers of startups that are formed you know, in America each year, uh, you're in the elite, 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 tiniest of percentages. So you've accomplished uh, something unbelievable to, to build a company that's worth $75 million. So strictly speaking, again, kind of similar to the first ridiculous hypothetical I made, this one where you're just getting a, a, you know, a handshake deal is a little bit more realistic, but that $75 million my gut reaction in a way would just be like, wow, $75 million. What, you know, what a fantastic exit. I built a company. It's worth, worth almost $100 million. I, I just couldn't be more proud and grateful and excited. I can't wait to take this to my board. I can't wait to take this offer to everybody. And, and this is great. Uh, and you might also be thinking to yourself as a founder, simple math here, I own 50% of this company. So I own 50% of this company. I can't wait to see, of that $75 million, I can't wait to see $37.5 million in my pocketbook very shortly here. This is, this is just so exciting. Then you go and you take the, the, the term sheet or the $100 million you know, oral offer to your, to your board and, and you're talking with them and you're saying, you know, this is so exciting. I, you know, ultimately, like, yes, there's been a lot of positive things with our company, but ultimately I don't think that there's you know, a high uh, odds of far more potential than a $75 million exit now or in the future. And you, your, your VC will say, okay, per, I'm making this up. And the VC could say a lot of things, but I would suspect they might say, that's wonderful, you know, that you, you think this is the very best offer we're gonna ever have in terms of $75 million exit. As you know, we put in a $50 million uh, investment into your company, and we don't just want our money back. So for example, they might be thinking to themselves, we would like to at least get, say, one and a half X. We'd like to at least get, you know, our money back plus make some profit here, we are investors. So suddenly, if you've raised $50 million and they want 1.5X, your Series B lead investor does, so 50 million times 1.5, so now suddenly you're talking about a $75 million return to your investors, okay? So suddenly that, that incredible offer that was given to you, that you're imagining all these wonderful things, it is a great offer, it, 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 you built a, a great company, but if your investors put in $50 million, it wouldn't be surprising if they wanted to see a profit. So suddenly out of that $75 million where the liquidation preference becomes really important is that not so much the preference term itself in the documents, but how it works with the control provisions we talked about. So you have to get the separate approval of Series B and Series A and a majority of common stock for an acquisition. So you would have to go talk to your A round VC, your B round VC, and you'd have to say, look, 
Series BVC, with all due respect, I would totally want you to be happy with this outcome, but if you demand all $75 million of this exit and Series A has nothing or, or, or we receive nothing as founders and employees, it, nobody's going to vote for this. I mean, there's literally no economic incentive for anybody except Series B to vote for this. But the, the Series B investor may, may, you know, stand firm in that. Uh, it may ask you to go negotiate a higher offer or, you know, the deal may fall apart. That's why there's all these varieties of outcomes. But the key thing I just want to kind of dig down here is just to explain that the, the liquidation preference waterfall is, is really meant more for dissolution and, and the company goes out of business. But how it works with that protective provision is the understanding that your, your investors are going to receive money before you as founders are going to receive money. So in this exit event scenario that I'm painting for you, there's going to be a discussion. The A round has its own separate approval rights, we discussed. Now B round has its own separate approval rights as a class. A round has its approval right. B round has its approval right. You as the founders have an approval right. So all three of these parties have to agree on, on some kind of way to allocate that $75 million offer to acquire the company. And so that's really just an active and, and uh, negotiation. OK, uh, dividend preference. Uh, What's really key there is that venture capital firms want exits. They want exits. They are not in it to build a medium-sized business that spins out wonderful net profit margins every year and just stays that way for 20 years. Uh, venture capital firms are looking to exit from their portfolio companies. They look, so they're, they're basically hoping that every single one of their portfolio companies gets acquired, goes public, uh, or, or some kind of you know kind of more diminished you know actually like an asset purchase agreement. So they don't necessarily want uh, to to sit uh, because it's it, for venture capital firms it's not just about how much they return it's about when they return the capital right internal rate of return IRR you hear that a lot. So exits are the preferred approach of venture capital firms. In addition to that, they also do not want founders to necessarily. Uh, focus on how to make net profits and issue out dividends because founders for example who own say at a more early stage startup who own 50 percent or more of the cap table you can imagine a startup has uh, 10 million dollars in net profits for the year fantastic founders think to themselves I'd, I'd like to you know I'd like I or we would like to write a total of five million dollar checks to ourselves as dividends uh, we'd like to buy homes or do other than nice things and I don't think the venture capital firms are, are opposed to the goals there of the founders, but what they're going to want consistently is they're going to say, don't take that $10 million and issue out $5 million to yourselves and another the remaining $5 million, most of it to us or something like that. That's not what we're looking for. Use that $10 million in net profits to achieve more growth. Push towards growth, push towards a higher valuation at your exit, push towards an exit. So because there's just a resistance to dividends, whereas a, a publicly traded company that's massive, they might have a billion dollars in net profits, like General Electric or, or somebody might have a, a billion dollars in net profits, maybe more historically. They could just simply issue out a cash dividend to all the investors, which happens with a lot of major companies, or they could reinvest in growth and again try to increase market cap and increase the stock price of General Electric. So it's the exact same thing, publicly traded companies, privately held companies. Do you issue out dividends or do you go for growth? That question is always there, it's just that when it's private, the venture capital firms haven't liquidated, they haven't gotten their exit event yet, so they want to really, generally speaking, discourage dividends. So the dividend preference is functionally just meant to prevent startups from issuing out dividends, uh, both because the dividends have to be approved by the venture capital firm, again, a special contractual uh, provision approval right, uh, but also there's a preference that goes to the investors. They get money um, sort of above and beyond just a ratable share of the dividends. Okay. Protective provisions, I think we covered them pretty well. Information rights, very important in the sense of for any investor, you want to know how the company's going, uh, and, and that's a, a key right any major VC will have as part of their investment, uh, but other investors should be looking out for that too. Uh, last thing, or two last things here would be down round uh, anti dilution. So, this is uh, there's a formula called broad based weighted average. Uh, I'm gonna, not going to spend as much time on this, but if a startup raises a down round from, say, B to C, so the pre-money valuation of Series B is 100 million and the pre-money valuation for Series C is 80 million, uh, what's going to happen is, depending on how the term of yeah, the down round and addition term is negotiated, but uh, if we're talking about broad base weighted average to, to keep it very simplistic, uh, a certain portion of the dilution will just simply be, that comes from that down round, will be grossed up, will be given for free, so most close to free shares for the previous rounds, you know, investors to give them more equity. The result of that means that the Series C investors are simply buying at this lower valuation, they're buying whatever chunk of equity they are. 
Series B, for example, in the scenario of Series C is the, the down round, they're getting their equity. Series B is getting an extra boost of equity, which would not normally happen if it was an up round. And so what does all that dilution mean? The Series C is diluting now, Series B is getting a gross up. The founders are taking the brunt of this. Okay, uh, and also uh, if if Series C is a down round compared to B, but not compared to A, uh, then A is not going to receive that. So the down round dilution goes downstream in the sense of who's taking the burden of that, who's taking the impact of that. Okay, uh, so th that's just kind of some risk mitigation for VC firms. Something to think about if you're a startup that if you, you know, because we're going back to valuation here a little bit, going back to one of the earliest topics, as a startup founder, I said, oh, you should always just want the highest valuation no matter what, and that might be slightly overly simplistic in the sense of if you raise at, uh, from an investor who's maybe not a typical venture capital firm and you raise at 5x the valuation that would probably be considered market if you went around to 10 different VC firms, uh, you might have your next round be at a lower valuation, and that might cause you some uncomfortable uh, dilution on on that end. So, and then co-sale right, we're going to talk about corporate best practices. But a co-sale right mostly is a restrictive right that prevents founders from selling their equity in a company unless they bring along all the other investors, or the, you know, the, the lead investors. So the idea there is you don't want the founder to go sell their 25% equity stake in the company or 50% equity stake in the company to another party and leave the VC behind because they don't necessarily know who's buying the shares. Do they want to go into business with a new, if you not call them founder, it might be a private equity firm. Do they want to go into business with this new you know, key holder? They don't know that. And they also want liquidity again. So they're not going to want founders to sell their equity on their own. So co sale right more or less brings everybody together and forces everybody to work together as one unit uh, to uh, decide what kind of exit uh, we're going to take, what kind of exit offer we're going to take. Uh, there's there's different provisions here. If you're more experienced, we'll be talking about what about drag along, what about tag along. Tag along and co sale are roughly similar. Drag along rights, real uh, really quick, just you know, at a certain threshold of shareholding votes, you want to grab the stragglers to allow a quick exit um, or, or expedite your exit uh, documents. Okay. So here's just kind of our conclusion slide about convertible nodes, safes, and preferred stock, how they're different. We've covered all of these terms, so I'm sort of leaving this slide uh, up here to you know, be viewed for a minute and digested. Uh, the real key differences that we've talked about are really just control. Okay, uh, the di dilutive effect uh, can be slightly different. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to one more slide to go into a little bit more detail. I think the only thing I want to highlight here is that convertible notes have debt elements, and I don't like convertible notes. I, I prefer safes. I think they match what investors and founders are actually thinking in terms of uh, uh, what they want. Because with a safe, we're talking, we talked about how you can do a safe quickly. You don't have to negotiate the protective provisions. You don't have to take the control. All, all these things we've talked about, keeping costs down. Convertible notes do achieve those goals, but they add in this layer of debt, meaning that the company, uh, usually after, say, one or two years is maturity date. And at that point, the company may be, one or two things may happen. I've seen it misused in both directions. One is that a founder uh, that is doing great, you know, the company is doing really well. Upon maturity of the convertible notes, say they have a lower valuation cap, one, two, three, four million, might elect to actually pay back the convertible note holders with just their principal plus some interest. And usually interest on convertible notes is a fraction of what you can expect for a, a bank. You know, I mean, if, there's a reason why startups can't raise money from banks. Sometimes I open my talk actually with this, uh, is that, you know, without uh, having any collateral that a startup can base things on, like a house or, say, property of other types. Since a startup really doesn't have that kind of collateral, banks are not going to loan money to them. They're just too high risk and it can't be secured. So when you see an interest rate on convertible notes, it's usually like 8% or you know something like that. And that may seem to you, wow, that's double what you know, banks are currently offering for you know a home, a home loan. But it's vastly different if First of all, banks just wouldn't loan money, generally speaking, to an early stage startup. But if they did, the interest rate would be astronomical, something vastly more than eight percent. So, point being there that you know startups are raising money from venture capital firms because the venture capital firms and angel investors, everybody wants equity. That's they want the upside potential of this investment. So, if instead you get your debt paid back with eight percent interest, you're going to be extremely disappointed because the startup is probably going to be thriving if they're paying you back your principal. Now, conversely. What happens probably slightly more often is that a startup uh, has raised money from investors who maybe don't invest in startups as often, don't understand the, the, 
sort of things like community and your reputation and other matters. And as soon as they can, they try to claw back or demand back the money from the startup. So at maturity, they're just like, hey, hey, I don't care how much is left in your bank account, 50 cents on my dollar, I'm getting back 25 cents on my dollar, I want my money back. And that can really, really hurt your startup, obviously. So in general, I just don't think that uh, convertible debt really matches what uh, experienced investors expect out of a, an early stage investment or what founders expect. So a few key financing details that I want to mention here are fully diluted basis. So this goes back to the dilutive uh, topic that we talked about. Uh, every good Series A VC knows how to build in uh, all money that's been raised to date, meaning previous convertible securities, and an employee pool. So if you are, when, you, when you hear about a, a venture capital firm saying you know it's a $20 million pre-money valuation, they mean that, that that's what your business is worth and your share price is going to reflect that. So that means there should be everything boiled into your cap table. There should not be any extra shares that dilute the VC, okay? And this topic, I would love to give a visual guide on, and, and again, we could talk for a long time on it, but I'll, I'll try to keep it a little bit simpler and just explain that if, if you look at the market cap of a publicly traded company, take Amazon, if you're ever wondering, well, what, what does the share price represent? And then you, you click you know, on, on your iPhone, for example, and then you see this kind of market cap number. And so it'll show that Amazon's one trillion, for example, or something like that. So what, what's, what's the, is there, you may have wondered, is there connectivity to this? There definitely is. So if you're, the market cap, the valuation of Amazon is determined by the price per share multiplied by the total number of shares in the company, okay? All three things work together and they're all essential. You screw, you, you mess with one and you're messing with the other numbers. So for example, if Amazon suddenly just issued more shares in the company, okay, that would have a dilutive effect on the number of shares, it would have a dilutive effect on, on the price per share, okay? I mean, different details about that. But coming back outside of publicly traded companies, what's key here is that when you're trying to figure out a startup's valuation and how do you accurately represent that, what I would say the accurate or you know experienced venture capital firm uh, definition of that is all shares should be baked into the pre-money valuation. So for example, you shake hands, you agree on a $20 million pre-money valuation, and then the venture capital firm is gonna look at your cap table. And your cap table means all, you know, kind of the list of all your shares. It also is gonna have a tab for all your convertible securities that you've raised. And the venture capital firm is going to say, okay, you've already raised $1 million at a $4 million cap, and you've raised $2 million at an $8 million cap. Now, simple math in your head, you already knew I, that each time you gave away 20% of your company. Well, now that's actually going to be converted into equity alongside those pretty much those formulas. So the venture capital firm is going to say, okay, let's assume the math here. You have 10 million shares as a, as a company and we're going to take 10 million shares, we're gonna look at your convertible securities and what kind of valuation cap they had, we're gonna do the math, we're gonna convert the convertible securities into shares, and then we're gonna increase your employee pool or create an employee pool and put those shares in. So now instead of your original 10 million shares in your cap table, you're gonna have substantially more. You know, Imagine millions of shares potentially from your convertible securities and, and, and millions of shares from your employee pool. That final number of shares, the VC will say, okay, that $20 million valuation we talked about, take that valuation, divide it by this larger number of shares, that's our price per share, okay? So when you see that price per share, that's saying what a $20 million valuation is, and they're connected. And of course, you could change any part of that, and it would change all parts of the formula. I would say that the fair, reasonable, as well as a, a, you know, traditional approach to that is building in all previous money raised if it was at a lower valuation cap. And I would say if you're an early stage investor, you should actually be looking into making sure that convertibles raised at lower valuations than yours are baked into your valua valuation cap when you're investing in a convertible security after the first money was raised at a lower cap on a convertible security. But if you're a founder and you're an investor, you should be thinking about how do these convertibles, how do these employee pools, do they get built into our price per share or not? That's the kind of key consideration. As I said, I'd love to give a visual guide on this. That's something you really need an Excel chart and to, to work through together. Um, so pro rata rights, I just want to emphasize there, as an investor or as a startup, you need to think about, as an investor, you certainly want to double down on your winners. You want to invest more money on your best startups. That's how venture capital makes money. They're driven by their winners. Venture capital firms are driven by their winners. Conversely, as a startup, we, we talked about how much equity do you want to give away 
uh, at what time. And so when you already are receiving money from your lead investor, do you need more money than what they're already offering you? Because for example, that $5 million check at a $20 million pre-money valuation, uh, that might be as much equity as you want to give away. You know, you might not want to give away more than 20% of your company at that stage. But if you have pro rata rights, you may have to give up six, seven, you know, $8 million uh, at that valuation, or even have to decrease your pre-money depending on the term. So, Pro rata rights, uh, usually, you know, it's like more money, more problems is a joke. Uh, that, that's pretty much what uh, happens here uh, with pro rata rights. Uh, it, it's obviously uh, good problems to have for everybody involved. Uh, investors really want pro rata rights. They want to double down on their winners. As founders, you have to consider the dilutive impact. So uh, those are the two things there. And then if you are investing in a convertible security, a safer convertible note, I just want to emphasize and for the founders also to, to know that uh, what's what happens? We haven't converted to stock yet prior, if, we, if we're taking an exit offer prior to Series A. So you need to have a term in there that explains what economically happens if there's an exit prior to Series A. Because that exit is going to be entirely determined by the founders. They're not going to receive investor approval of that. They're not shareholders. But what will economically happen if you put in a valuation cap is usually you should be receiving the greater of a set multiple, 1 or 2x, or the greater of the amount of money you would receive if you did convert to common stock immediately prior to the acquisition at that valuation cap. So um, that's an important detail to think through. Corporate best practices. Uh, this is something that I think is very important for investors and for founders to consider. So when for us at Plug and Play, we invest in startups at a pretty early stage uh, typically. This is where we're trying to make sure these things are always in place for our startups and it's really for their health and our health. So IP assignment agreements, you want to make sure that every founder, every employee signs an IP assignment agreement with the company to make sure that the intellectual property that's developed even prior or immediately prior to forming the legal you know, C-Corp, but certainly everything thereafter, that that intellectual property belongs to the company because otherwise what are, you, what are you investing into, what are you buying into, and you don't want IP litigation down the road. Uh, vesting schedule becomes extremely important. Vesting schedule, uh, typically, if I had to pick a, a typical vesting schedule, I would say it's a one-year cliff and a four-year vesting schedule. This means that uh, we want founders, as well as their employees, to be on this kind of vesting schedule, meaning that if somebody, uh, if there's a dispute between the co-founders, and I've seen just about everything from uh, uh, trips to Bora Bora to rediscover oneself to just uh, an offer from Apple for, you know, $800,000 a year and some base salary and stock options and uh, or, or just disputes about the direction of the company. So I've seen I've seen a lot of different ways that founding teams can get broken up and you doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a great product or there isn't a great company. So you don't want though you don't want the issues of people leaving the company to sink the company. So in that sense then if you have a one year cliff or you have a four year vesting schedule it means that you hopefully will not have a bunch of your cap table held by people who are no longer with the company or may even be antagonistic to the company. So you, you want to have that vesting schedule to if things don't work out in the first six months you hopefully will have a clean split. You'll hopefully have a cap table that, that hasn't even been changed. It's as if the hire or the co-founder didn't happen. Uh, conversely, if they've been there for a while, uh, you know, they hopefully at that point therefore have contributed a bunch of sweat equity and help and, and improve the company and, and they're credited for that amount of stock, but they're not credited for, you know, stock in future years that they haven't earned. Uh, an employee pool, we think that's really important for startups, even at a very early stage. Uh, to use stock as currency is a key for startups to successfully grow. Uh, the number one thing that startups always have a challenging time with, besides from, I'd say, building a great product that customers love and then going out and great, getting those customers, the sales process, the other real challenge is just to do all those things, build a genuine, authentic, wonderful business that consumers love or, or major corporations as consumers love, uh, and do all that while not running out of money. And of course, venture capital money is, is really meant to be spent on growth. It's really meant to be spent on capturing market share and all those things. But uh, even if you're successfully somewhat raising money, it's always a fight against burn as you're trying to uh, you know, uh, spend money to make money. So an employee pool can be used as currency. If you're an early stage startup or really any startup, uh, stock options can be a huge differentiating factor uh, for, between working at a much larger, more established company uh, and working at a, an early stage startup. So you really want to be able to incentivize your employees with stock. 
we want uh, an employee pool to be created. Most important reason why is, that, as I said, we don't want startups to run out of money, and we want them to attract great talent. So how do you not run out of money and attract great talent? One of the things that really helps solve both those problems is uh, having an employee pool. We, we say, generally speaking, at least 15% prior to Series A, but you know, 10 to 15%. The uh, quick element that I want to make, because I want to be, try to be as relatively uh, even uh, in, in this discussion as I can, is that as a founder, even if you understand the logic of an employee pool, you might be saying, well, I want my investors to be diluted by that pool. And the investors might say, well, founders, I want you to be diluted by that pool. So that's where the economic discussion comes in, uh, certainly for plug and play, as well as most uh, VC firms, we want the employee pool built into our uh, pre-money valuation. So we don't want to be diluted by the initial pool. Uh, if there's already an acceptably uh, sufficient pool, then that's fine. Now, your employee pool will be called refreshed over time. So over time, you'll give away your first 10% equity for 15%, and you'll need to increase your pool. And that tends to happen alongside financings or as you organically grow. Uh, the good news there is that while percentage-wise, uh, your pool eventually you start giving away less in terms of percentage, less in terms of number of shares, uh, there's, there's, those shares mean a little bit more uh, in, in terms of they're more likely to, to hit. OK, and founders in control, uh, we touched on that topic a, a little bit already, but you don't want to give away too much equity. You don't want to give away 50% in your first million uh, or your first round. You don't want to give away an inordinate or on, off-market number of board seats, et cetera, et cetera. At least through, I'd say, Series A and Series B, the founders should, generally speaking, be in control of their company. Now, uh, kind of walking through this quickly, uh, you can imagine Series A, you give up one board seat, okay, two and one, we talked about that. Series B, now it's two and two, two lead investors and, and two founders, for example. Uh, there'll probably be an independent fifth board seat. Uh, it tends, this is just off the cuff for me, but yeah, this tends to lean towards a founder-friendly, independent uh, board member, but let's get to Series C. Series C now, assuming that each and every round is, uh, of venture capital money is taking a board seat, suddenly the founders are in the minority and don't control their board anymore. Uh, so I would say in Series C, that, that, that's a con that happens quite a bit. Uh, and and uh, I believe there's a great Silicon Valley episode or episodes, plural, about uh, founders losing control over their company. It happens a lot. Uh, I will say here that if you're a startup that has a really high amount of leverage because people kind of always ask like how is Mark Zuckerberg staying in control of, his, of Facebook to this day uh, well you can if you have a lot of leverage at the series C stage and you have competing term sheets and your startup is absolutely phenomenal you can negotiate to have for example your founder shares your common stock as a founder you can negotiate for that to have extra voting rights you know the power of voting 10 shares for every one share for example or certain specific contractual provisions that say you have control over this or you have determining votes over that and whether it be operational elements or other things that's only going to come if, as I said, you have competing term sheets, you are just crushing it as a startup. Really briefly on venture debt, I want to talk really quickly through this. Uh, as a startup, we talked about how, hey, banks don't loan money to really early stage startups. You might be able to start with a small business loan from the Small Business Administration, but uh, generally speaking, banks are not who you're going to be able to raise money from as a startup. Well, once you've raised your Series A round, or B or C, Actually, now you're at a stage as a business where you can think about talking to a bank. Uh, and, and banks and loaning money, that is, that is pretty much one of the key ways that, that all businesses grow uh, and, and thrive. So I'm not necessarily advocating venture debt. Uh, it's something that has to be considered. And certainly for investors, your lead investor, they're going to in certain ways, I think, consider it even more than you. Um, but venture debt is basically you're taking out a loan uh, from a bank. Uh, they tend to operate more as line of credits, but they can also be lump sum. They can be structured in different ways. And all the various terms of them, when they're paid back, uh, the interest rate, uh, whether you, you just pay down interest and, and do a, a lump sum principal payment, balloon payment down the road, or whether you do incremental, every term can be negotiated on those. The only element I'll mention is that, generally speaking, there's specific banks that specialize in this who understand startups, and they and they tend to look at both your revenue and your you know cash you know on, on account already. So generally speaking, when you've raised a round, you can kind of leverage the money you've raised from your venture capital firm, which is very dilutive equity-wise, and you can take on money which. Uh, has a serious ramifications in the sense of you have to pay back this money and you do have to pay back with interest. And for the investor, the loan will be senior to their liquidation preference. So uh, venture debt loan after Series A has, has preference. 
so to the Series A investors. So there's a lot of considerations, but basically, I just want startups and investors, you know, or corporations or corporate partners to be aware that you can, at a certain stage of growth in a startup, uh, talk to banks, Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic Bank, banks in Silicon Valley, but other banks that specialize in venture debt, and you can leverage the uh, accounts receivable and the revenue you have and the financing you've raised to uh, uh, gain additional capital to spur growth if you have a good strategy around it. Okay, let's talk about exit events. We talked about how for uh, for venture capital firms an exit is essential, it's everything for them. There's, uh, I'm simplifying here, there's two primary ways for a, for a startup to exit. That's uh, getting acquired or uh, going IPO. And then I have the third bubble there, which is just quickly to mention that for investors sometimes, uh, as companies increasingly stay private for a long time uh, before they go public, that you can sometimes sell on the secondary market. Uh, there's also this direct listings uh, increase, uh, which is uh, sort of a, a, it's a taking your, well, we'll skip direct listings. That we could talk about that as a whole separate topic. I want to want to stay with just you can as a venture capital firm can sometimes sell their shares on the secondary market uh, while the company's still privately held. So let's go into some M and A terms that matter. Uh, we talked about waterfall distributions in pink. Uh, I want to highlight that. Uh, we, we, we discussed that extensively, and I just want to reiterate that's one of the key considerations. Some of the other key considerations. We talked about very early on in my discussion, I talked about off the cap table distribution. So in that scenario where, hey, the founders look like they're going to get nothing, and you're only going to return money to your investors, uh, maybe give them a slight multiple, or just return their money back, or less than their money back, nothing in it for founders. You spent seven years, you paid yourself peanuts as salary for so many years, uh, and, and you're just so sad that you've seemingly built a company that was acquired for a good amount of money, and you have not all that much to show for it. Uh, to solve situations like this, and, and even in situations that aren't you know, like that, uh, it's common that, when, that the acquiring company wants the talent and the leadership to join, not just the clients, not just the product, but they want the management to join as well, the most talented people from the company. So uh, off the cap table distributions are a way to basically, why what, what, what I call them in parentheses is they're not, it's not necessarily a legal term, it's basically saying retention bonuses. So can a founder or founder stay at the acquiring company for a year or two years and be compensated for joining that company? Okay, so that's compensation, therefore the, the idea there is the reason why it's off the cap table is that it's not related to the value of the company as it's been built to today. It relates to services rendered in the future after the company's been acquired. That also connects somewhat with the double trigger vesting that you see here. So this is a good term for investors, uh, not as much for founders. Double trigger vesting versus single trigger. So let's say that as a founder you still have years, or an employee or you know senior management, anybody, Let's say you have years left on your vesting schedule when the company gets acquired. Well, when the company gets acquired, if you have single trigger vesting, all your unvested shares will instantly accelerate and you'll be fully vested at the time of acquisition, meaning you get your money, assuming that your stock options or your shares are in the money, that's just a strike price, you, you, you walk away with your money and you have no need unless you really want to go work for the acquiring company, you have no need to go there. Uh, double trigger vesting says, assuming you have time left on your vesting schedule, you need to go work for the acquirer. Uh, now, if they fire you for, you know, without cause, then you're accelerated, uh, you know, in terms of your vesting. Uh, or if there's kind of hardship in trying to take this work for this new company that's across the country or other issues, again, you could be accelerated. So it's not, uh, you know, handcuffs, you know, going to jail. You just have to join this acquiring company. But uh, it is in the sense of uh, your you. you kind of do need to join the company assuming it doesn't cause hardship and uh, assuming that they, they don't terminate you without cause. Uh, so your shares kind of just continue to vest. All right, uh, the last three points at the bottom there, technical milestones, and I would also say stock versus cash are two very high level but key things to consider. So uh, when you're the uh, acquiring company, are you going to use your stock as compensation or are you going to use cash or are you going to use a mixture of both? Uh, and, and for a startup, uh, you know, receiving stock in, in the acquiring company, how's the performance of that stock, that company going to go in the future? These are all things to consider. Generally speaking, one thing I'll mention is that 
uh, when you're talking about stock, it's a, usually a 30-day moving average. So what the average price of the publicly traded company for the last 30 days, that's what's used to price the stock uh, in the acquirer or to determine that value of that stock. Uh, but technical milestones, I want to refer to that as it's like, okay, it could be cash, it could be stock of the, you know, from the acquirer or acquiring the startup. But the, the acquirer might also say something like this, we will pay you $100 million at closing uh, and pure cash. We will also give you $50 million of stock if the startup you know, achieves the following milestones post-acquisition. My comment on technical milestones is just that my purely my own personal experience is that startups, once they are acquired into a much larger company, no longer have the uh, uh, power to decide their own budget, to decide sales channels, to decide a lot of different things. They, they, you know, you may have built this great product, and you may say, "Let's push this out to existing clients." I myself will go personally hustle and and you know set up these meetings or do these calls or whatever it may be. And the larger company may say, "It's not about." That you're wrong or any of that is, is incorrect but it's just our focus all hands on deck has to be to sell this other product that it could be better could be worse whatever but the sales channel efforts need to be devoted to this and that's not a decision that you as a founder have any control over. i mean the worst that you could do is simply quit the uh you know large company that acquired you so you can't force the technical milestone to be met that's not uh, it's not a force of will that will get you there. It's a lot of other factors. So I will say the technical milestones, my experience of them is not that anybody means the acquirer or the or the startup, not that anybody means for the milestones to not be met and that it's any kind of nefarious thing. It's just that so often uh, you know, interests do end up not being as aligned a year later or six months later as they were at the time of acquisition. Uh, there's just so many different multifaceted factors that a lot of times I think technical milestones are not met. Uh, so I think that's something to consider. Uh, escrow, basically just simply, uh, which will connect it to limitations on liability, you want to be aware that uh, usually a portion of the proceeds in an exit are kept in escrow for a period of usually 12 to 24 months, and that portion uh, tends to be anywhere between, I'd say maybe uh, 10 and 25 percent, real, uh, 10 to, eh, real, real rough rule of thumb of how much is held in escrow. What's held in escrow is money to satisfy kind of uh, liabilities. So the acquiring company is going to, of course, diligence uh, start up quite a bit, and they're going to, and, and as just a matter of form, going to have uh, representations and warranties. The startup's going to represent and warranty uh, what what products it's built, what IP litigation it has, a, a host of factors. Of course, we could also do a whole topic on M and A. The key here, I just want people to be aware of, is that. You want limitations on the liability both as founders and as investors. So as investors or founders, you want a limitation of liability such that uh, two key things I'll mention is that you want uh, 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 liability to be uh, 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 several and not joint uh, in the sense of you don't want uh, all of the obligations, let's say there's an IP litigation for you know 20 or 25 million dollars, and the startup exit was uh, you know for you as an investor or you as a founder, you only received five million dollars. You don't want to be uh, 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 liable for the entire amount. You only want to be liable for your share of you know your your if you own five percent of the, if you own five percent of the company, you only want to be liable for your five percent of of the total damages or the claim. The other thing is just having a caps on this liability. You certainly never want to be liable for damages beyond what your ultimate return was uh, in the company. So let's say that as an investor, you invested $5 million, the exit brought you $15 million as a return. You don't want to be liable for any damages beyond that $15 million that you invested, kind of no matter what the claim is, or certainly at least anything less than abject you know, fraud. And you know whether you're sitting on the board or not, there's a lot of nuance there. but just want to put those topics out there. For many of our corporate partners who have uh, off the balance sheet CVC arms, a lot of times I know we talk about corporate venture capital, I think one of the key uh, uh, distinguishing factors right away with a, with a major corporation which is exploding, corporate venture capital is exploding, we all know that, is that corporate venture capital, uh, uh, corporate venture capital is not really funds. So for me the key thing about a fund is that you're raising money from third parties and your primary objective is uh, you know financial returns 
So generally speaking, uh, while corporations are investing in startups and they are taking equity, so there's a lot of similarities, and hence we call it venture capital, and we'll say, oh, you know, a, a certain corporate just started their own fund. Well, we're not necessarily saying they started a fund. To me, it's more like they, they started their technology investing initiative, and it's investing off of the balance sheet. So, but occasionally, uh, corporates have done genuine funds, raise money from third parties. So that's one of the key things. Are, are there limited partners involved, or is it just balance sheet funds? And then, of course, are there, is, it, is, is the fund primarily driven by strategic objectives or ROI? I think that's a key consideration when you're a CVC or you're a startup talking to a CVC. Now, business development contracts that you see there, it's the you know, one thing I think I find very interesting and kind of where I'm, where I'm listing all these, I'm not going to go over them one by one, but what I find very interesting is how to layer in number two or and number three, how do you layer those into a term sheet or to, or into joining a, a lead investor? Uh, I find it very interesting. There's a lot of new areas and terms that are being developed right now uh, or nuances within terms of how can a corporate, a CVC, say their primary objective is strategic, how can they gain that value by putting in $5 million into a startup or a million or 500K? Uh, if you're investing in a startup, other than you know, I don't want to say draconian, but other than very uh, limiting terms like a right of first offer on acquisition, because that kind of can chill the startup's ability to go out and, and go to market and get the best offer it can. But what, what are other options, uh, or, 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 or that option, but I mean, what are the options uh, for strategic value for strategic investors? And can you move things like, can you increase a pre-money valuation, or can you receive terms as a startup that help to sweeten uh, the deal if you're going to give up an exchange of strategic value? So I think, I think people are coming up with new ways to figure out new uh, economic terms to give uh, uh, strategic value that everybody's happy with. So that's a fine, I find that to be a very interesting space right now. I'll close with international markets. Uh, I will say that uh, this is again just kind of more personal experience and this is really high level. We could talk about this topic for a long time, but that the thanks to the National Venture Capital Association, thanks to many, many years of the Delaware Chancellor Court, many, many years of uh, venture capital in the United States and in Silicon Valley, that we've gotten a lot of systems and standards in place, a lot of legislative lobbying efforts to make investing in startups simple uh, and efficient and consistent. And so there's great law firms that are used to this. There are things like Carta, which will manage your cap table. There are escrow companies and shareholder representative companies like SRS and Acquium, and, and so the, the SRS, Acquium, and, and uh, other companies that do this. Uh, and I'm not trying to name drop any uh, specific partners, uh, but uh, I would just say that it's very uh, efficient to close investments in the United States. I find other jurisdictions to uh, have more administrative difficulties uh, because, for example, if we're investing in a Brazilian startup and there's an exit, uh, there's not going to be that uh, escrow agent shareholder representative that's going to help uh, manage things like the escrow and, and uh, the shareholder representation. So there's so many different little things that make things generally, generally a little bit difficult. I mean, in Germany, as an example, the notarization process to notarize the signatures for every investment or major shareholder decision, that definitely adds time and cost. So. Um, however, I will say that the general principles we covered in this talk, because it's very high level, apply to almost every jurisdiction. So when you're talking about dilution, control, these terms that we've gone over, they apply to almost every market. Almost every market understands those concepts. I will say, though, that convertible securities are not as prevalent in a lot of other markets. Uh, and part of the reason there is because there's more statutory protection for common stock or ordinary shareholders. So in, in European jurisdictions, for example, if you are an ordinary shareholder, you just you don't know one thing about negotiating documents, you just say, sign me up, give me 5% stock, I'll pay you this, uh, in your company, I'll pay you this amount of money, something that simple, and you simply give them ordinary shares, well, they're going to enjoy statutory, meaning laws and protections passed by the government, that uh, rather than by contract, by negotiating between the parties, you'll have statutory protections such as a certain degree of information rights, pro rata right, etc. So sometimes when you already are receiving those rights statutorily as a baseline, there isn't as much of this need for convertible securities and, and, and the reasons for that. Uh, for our international startups, uh, we could also talk about your flip uh, extensively. Uh, here I'm just going to touch high level that 
I think the most important thing is to try to figure out what's your target market, what's your most important market, and that's both for fundraising and for selling your product or acquiring customers. So if your target market is absolutely without a, you know, with a bullet, the most important market is the United States and you want to raise money from US VCs and you, you know, want most of your customers, everything is in, in the United States, generally speaking a flip to having your parent company be in the US is going to be worth the time and cost. Uh, to do. Conversely, if, if the U.S. is just a marketplace for you, an important one, uh, but not the essential one, then uh, and, and you might want a few American investors, but it's not, again not essential, you might have European investors, or you might have uh, Chinese investors, or you might have Japanese investors. So all of that just kind of factors into where should your parent company be, because your parent company is where your investors should be. Uh, I would generally speaking, caution. Uh, ever, uh, you know, I, I generally speaking like to avoid having subsidiaries that are non wholly owned, and I think most venture capital firms feel the same way. Uh, that creates a lot of uh, uh, structural issues and, and conflicts of interest. So, uh, raise money for your parent company, and where your parent company is best situated can vary. You can always have an operational subsidiary to get business done in that country, but in terms of fundraising in particular, that should always be through the parent company, so you have a decision there. Uh, sometimes startups will ask me LLCs or C corps. Uh, uh, I will say mostly there. The key thing there is that uh, a, certainly to go public, you have to be a, a C corp. But besides from the downstream considerations, I'd say there's all these efficiencies built in to being a Delaware C corp in terms of an employee stock option plan that can be so easily off the shelf be done by a great law firm, which can so easily be administered through Carta. There are uh, many other benefits in just terms of everything is much more boilerplate in terms of your restricted stock purchase agreements for your founders. Uh, you know, we can kind of go on and on efficiencies there. The primary reason I would say that LLCs, if, if anybody's trying to recommend that for a startup, I would just generally speaking like, you know, 99.9% .9 of startups end up needing to be, you know, Delaware C Corps. That's, I would pursue that from day one for all startup founders. That's absolutely my, uh, my advice. But the reason why sometimes say a founder who is bootstrapping their company, is much more experienced, has their own maybe personal wealth, other considerations, and they might be thinking of an LLC or might be advised for an LLC because if you can bootstrap your own company, for example, it's just an example, you build a company and you start having net profits every year, well, there's you know a double tax situation with a C Corp where you're gonna get taxed at the corporate level and you're gonna get taxed at the individual return level. So you can avoid that with LLCs where the corporate income just is you know, is, is passed through to the individual owners, the members of the LLC. So if you somehow are forming your own company, you're bootstrapping it yourself, you're looking to build a cash flow positive business, could be huge, could be mid-sized, you don't know, there might be some considerations there for an LLC. So I just don't want to say, oh, LLCs simply never make sense as an entity. They, they can make sense for a business, but generally speaking, if you're going on a, a you know, the traditional startup journey, it's a, it's a C Corp, a Delaware C Corp. Uh, that's the, the end of uh, the, the talk here. There's uh, so much depth we cover on so many of these topics, uh, but I want to give it, you know, a high-level you know, overview of some of the things that matter here. And again, thank you for uh, joining us at Plug and Play. Uh, we hope uh, as a startup or as a corporate you find a lot of value in our ecosystem, and uh, we, we have so much fun and uh, we find so much meaning in, and, uh, in, in connecting uh, the, the different parts of our ecosystem. So I'll, I'll stop there. and. Uh, open it up for a Q&A. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. Lots of great content there. Um, and I wish we had more time for questions. But moving to the first question that we have here, um, can you provide some high level detail uh, around market terms for the liquidation preference, participation rights, pro rata rights, et cetera? You know, is it one time, is it one and a half times? What are you seeing today that's market and has that changed over the past five or 10 years? Uh, sure. Um, good question, Harvey. And, and, and I hope everybody uh, enjoyed the content. Uh, I would say that in the Valley, and that's one of the tough things these days about answering a question is it's like in Silicon Valley, are we talking the heartland? Are we talking in other foreign markets? Because there's, there's so much more investment across the world and we're part of that. Uh, I will say that in Silicon Valley, uh, in, in a normal, uh, the path of a normal startup, meaning you're on a happy path, an A round where the valuation increases in B round, the pre-money valuation increases in C round, et cetera. On a normal path like that, that your liquidation preference is called non-participating preferred. So basically you have a liquidation preference to receive 
you know, your money back if there's a if there's the unhappy exit. You might say like a dissolution or a sale of assets, something like that. Uh, if the exit is a positive return, then the assets will just be shared ratably across everybody based on their shareholding percentages, assuming that you're getting at least more than one X back. Um, uh, but I would say that having a participating preferred preference, which means that regardless of how the assets are ultimately distributed, that you would get a set amount of, you know, multiple on top of that. So what Harvey's talking about is that let's say you invest $10 million in A round uh, or your VC invests $10 million in A round and then uh, your company exits and right off the bat, you would receive an additional $10 million on top of your original 10 million. So you'd get 20 million back and then share ratably from the remaining proceeds in the acquisition. So I would say that if it's a, in Silicon Valley, it's very, uh, very typical that only have non-participating preferred, meaning your, your money back. Uh, and then if it's a really happy, you're just sharing ratably and things. Uh, now, of course, I, earlier in the talk, in the talk, I talk about how, you know, each and every exit requires the consent of each class of series preferred, generally speaking. So there can be a lot of negotiating at the bargain, at the bargaining table for what the actual results are of, of the exit. But I would say if you're a, a startup in the U.S. Uh, and things are going generally well, or or you're on you know a growth trajectory, I wouldn't be giving uh, participating preferred preferences to your investors. Uh, conversely, if you're an investor, you certainly would want that. But I wouldn't say it's very marked in Silicon Valley. Um, now, if it's a down round or the company is recapitalizing, it's kind of the company struggling, then a lot of non quote unquote non market terms do come into play. So it's very high risk investment to take on a company that's really struggling. A lot of terms come into play, such as multiples on the participating preferred uh, preference. Uh, and then I would also just say internationally, you'll see, I think, more investors who. Uh, depending on the market, uh, but in markets where there's maybe not as much capital, uh, and so therefore the investors have more leverage, uh, if they do, then they're, then they're more often going to look for participating preferred preference, even on a company that's, that's uh, moving up. Understood. And then on the topic of warrants, are they generally a good tool to use in, in the earlier stage uh, to keep investors interested? Or do you find that that might actually lock a startup in with a particular investor? And could that be a negative signal for future fundraising rounds? Uh, are you referring more, Harvey, to, to warrants in the context of like a, a lead VC who would want warrants excited? Or are we talking more about kind of giving warrants to uh, angel investors? What, what, what stage are we kind of talking about here? I think probably to the uh, the lead VC. I would say that uh, generally speaking, it's pretty rare to see warrants for a lead VC. I mean, they're negotiating a, a pre-money valuation that they think accurately reflects the company's value and that's heavily negotiated and assuming, you know, the VC is going to build in an increase to the employee pool and all previous convertibles and things like that. I will say that um, in terms of hedging bets, I more often see things like if it's a more of a growth stage round, like a series B or series C, you'll see uh, uh, milestones. So you'll see maybe tranches and milestones. So you'll see, hey, we'll invest 50 million at this valuation. If you meet these milestones, we'll invest an additional 50 million. That could even be coupled with a, a second part, which is that it should they fail to meet these milestones, either first tranche or second tranche, that then the valuation will be retroactively downgraded to a lower valuation. So I, I, you'll, you'll, I think I see more of that if, I'm not, I'm not saying I see that a lot, but I see that a little bit in, in growth stage rounds. I don't see too many, uh, you know, $5 million, $10 million check VCs who uh, include warrants, but basically just for founders to, to be aware of it. And, and not to say it never happens, Harvey you bring up something that does occasionally happen, but uh, it's mostly just, you know, extra equity. I mean, generally speaking, warrants, uh, let's say a Series A VC says, you know, we want to write a $5 million check and we also want warrants to purchase $500,000 of additional stock. It may seem like to the founders, well, hey, that's just, they just want to an option to invest another $500,000. What's wrong with that? Um, well, generally speaking, the warrant will have an exercise period, right? Five years, something like that. And so the by the time that you, the startup, are going to receive that $500,000 from the, the VC, the money is going to be pretty immaterial to you, one, probably, in all likelihood. And then two, they would be buying equity at that Series A valuation, even though now your company is at a far higher valuation. So so warrants are more or less just an opportunity to, 
kind of hedge bets, you might say, on valuation. It's really just kind of a way for VCs to get more equity without uh, committing capital. Sure. And then final question here uh, before we have to wrap up. Um, what is the process for, for fully vested founders to you know, have to rededicate those shares to a vesting schedule? Because oftentimes uh, the Series A investor, the lead investor may ask, uh, those founders, and like you mentioned earlier, you know, to re repatriate uh, themselves to a vesting schedule. What does that process look like, and, and is that fairly common? Great question. Yeah, that's one of those terms that I think you see it a lot in both directions. I, I see, uh, and and I think it is, is it definitely relates to leverage. So if if you have competing term sheets as a founder, you're going to be able to negotiate that in your favor, that term in your favor. Uh, and if you don't, then it might be, you might have to accede to it. But we're, just for everybody, it's a great question that Harvey's asking for, for everybody in the audience. Harvey's saying, hey, if you're a founder and you've already agreed to a vesting schedule, say four years and you're 75% vested, the VCs come in and say, we need a longer vesting period. Uh, we need to reopen this. Or if you haven't had any vesting schedule at all yet to date, we're going to add one now. And no founder wants to have their shares subject to, you know, buy back at marginal value. Uh, you know, it's a very high risk for founders who put in sweat equity for a number of years. But, you know, a Series A VC, especially depending on the stage of sometimes startups are able to raise an A round because they're, you know, not necessarily because of pure traction. It could be a lot based on the team uh, and the IP related to that team. Uh, so sometimes Series A VCs are still very concerned about the founders sticking together and staying long term with the company. Uh, so I see it go a lot. Of, I see it a fair share in both directions of reopening or, or vesting schedules. And, and I've also seen instances of, uh, of uh, leaving it alone or even uh, occasionally founders being able to remove their vesting schedule uh, uh, if they're in a high leverage situation. I'll just close with one thing that if I'm a founder or I'm a VC, there is a term that's kind of meant to be a growth stage vesting schedule, which is a co-sale right. So founders are not able to sell their equity in the company without bringing in their VCs along with them. So there's no opportunity with a co-sale, right? There's no opportunity for founders to just go and sell, say, their equity in total at last round's valuation. Let's say the founder's equity is worth, you know, $75 million. The founder can't go and sell $25 million worth of their stock on their own. They're going to have to bring in their VCs. And so that does mean that could the founder leave the company if they don't have any unvested shares left, they would be fully vested. They could leave the company and have fully vested stock, but they'd still not it would be value, you know, that they can only capture and realize down the road when there's finally an exit event. So most founders want to stay in charge and fully engaged in their company until they can achieve that exit event, given that they can't really uh, make any money until, until there's a sale and, and you can't sell piecemeal your shares. Uh, and then I'll just end with, Along those lines, sometimes in an A or B or C round, you'll see the VC uh, purchasing, say, $10 million in new money, and then, you know, also purchasing from the founders $1 or $2 million of their common stock. So there'll be $10 million of new money on the balance sheet, and then a transfer of wealth between the VC and the founders. And so the founders will sell their common stock, usually at some kind of haircut, but sometimes not. Uh, and that's to give those founders a little bit of liquidity to say buy a house uh, and, and you know raise a family or something like that while they're building their company. Right, take a little off the table. Um, I, and I know that's a tricky topic and it can be insulting um, and it's definitely hard for both parties to try to see eye to eye on this. But Mark, before I let you go, I, I did wanna ask one more question um, pertaining to you know the, the, the incredible times that we're in today. Um, so what is, your, what is your advice on fundraising during uncertain economic times and that can be today or that could be in six months from now but generally speaking what have you found works uh, whenever you're raising in these uncertain economic times uh, that is such a, a good question i could talk about it for a long time uh, there are obviously are some pretty elementary things so one is you know you just have to take a long strong look at your burn rate and you may have to make tough adjustments for that so uh, you know, we talked uh, earlier in my talk about milestones and what you need to do to reach those. Obviously, you know, now your milestones are shifting. At this exact moment, this is a pretty, pretty, uh, I say this might be the most challenging to forecast right now. It'd be easier if there was simply just the stock market uh, or the markets just doing poorly. I think that would be a simpler time because right now it's hard for, I think, startups to know when are their clients, when are their customers going to be eager to, to entering into contracts or 
Uh, so I think it, it's a, a uniquely challenging time. But I will say that it, speaking more generally to challenging economic times, uh, leverage every bit of money that you have. So as just an example of this, if you're a, a startup that just raised Series A or just raised Series B or even six months ago, uh, and so you're thinking, hey, I'm in a pretty solid capital position. Well, that's great. You're in, you're in a privileged few. But one way you can leverage that is to go talk to, as I talked about venture debt in my talk, you know, you can ex extend uh, your financial runway a longer period of time, hopefully to capture those those customers. Now, you'd have to get your, your VC to approve it. But I think that's one way to stretch capital is, is looking at all markets of, of capital right now. Uh, and... Uh, I mean, otherwise, it's just kind of, like I said, just keeping your keeping your burn low. Uh, and, and even a down round is not the end of the world. Uh, it's one of those things where it's a tough pill to swallow for founders because a down round really eats into founders more so than a Series A or Series B investor. They have anti-dilution provisions in place. But if you're the founder, I would just say it's not the end of the world to take on a down round. And if the dilution hit to use really bad, uh, but your company still has a lot of a lot of good things going for it. Lending Club's a great example of a down round that you know company ended up doing great, and they had a down round in the bad times. I think you can talk with you, have a conversation with the new VC, or and or your old VCs to talk about. Hey, right now we'll take this big crunch on the cap table for this down round. But in the future, if we start to build this company out more successfully, you know, you know, in the future, bring us back up equity wise, you know, so gross us up a certain percentage, give us, you know, two or 5% each, whatever, you know, back to the back in the company, should we reach certain milestones or certain things within a period of time? That way, if you take the crunch now as founders, you can hopefully recover some of that down the road. Understood. Understood. So big lesson here is that, um, don't be don't be shy of negotiating. But Mark, I want to I want to thank you again for spending some of your time with us. I thought there was a lot of insight there. I know we have a ton of questions that we'll try to filter through and get to you. Uh, and folks on the line listening in, if you have questions for Mark directly, again, please do reach out to someone at Plug and Play, and we will do our best to help connect you two. So thank you again, Mark. Thanks, Harvey. And yeah, I can also, you know, I mean, like uh, uh, startups here and, and corporates, whoever's in the audience, you may be represented by council. Uh, you know, certainly I, I try to help out our, our, our community, but our community is pretty large and, and uh, short on time. So I'll certainly try to help anybody with any question that they have. But also, if you need referrals to great counsel, I can do that. Unfortunately, attorneys cost money, but I can refer you to great counsel. And they can sometimes, depending on your stage, at your very early stage, they can defer fees and things like that. So you raise money. And internationally, you, you do know quite a bit of firms uh, across Europe as well. Yes, yes. Asia, Europe, et cetera. Yeah. Perfect. Take Thank care, you. everybody. Thanks, Harvey. Thanks, Mark.